Uh, and in just a few minutes, Richard Armitage will be here to talk about his role in the brand new epic series, Berlin Station, which is really good. He plays a CIA operative dispatched to Germany on a mission. It's really good. Now, in full disclosure, uh, Richard was here on Monday, and we captured the interview, and I think Richard got very excited because we had a great chat, and so he went on Twitter and alarmed and alerted his fans, so they're like, we can't find the interview! <laughs> so we have it for you today, I promise. I'm Larry Flick, and this is Entertainment Weekly Radio, and uh, actually almost uh, forgot to turn on the mics with uh, with our visitor today, Richard Armitage, who is joining us, who um, is is mildly homesick. I- I'm detecting a little homesickness from you. Yeah, I think it's to do. I think it's sitting in front of politics every day and looking at the American politics and then looking at British politics and kind of thinking, actually, I wish I was back over that side of the channel. You know, it would take this presidential race to make British politics look appealing. Because yeah. British politics... And we're in a really bad place at the moment. I well. know. With, like, with the changing of the Prime Minister and Brexit, all this stuff going on. Um, I always argue with my husband, I told you, off mic is, is a Brit. I always say, it's so arcane and weird here. And then he's here watching the debates with me and saying, let's go back to Britain. It's become very fashionable, though, hasn't it, to to look at something like so negative? It, it, it's clickbait, isn't it? It's some, it's some, you know, the whole is. Brexit thing is like it's all going down the pan. So, you know, life is terrible. I have to shrug it off a little bit. Well, you kind of do because I think uh, I don't know how old you are, but I'm old enough to say, with with authority, there's never a period in history where it's where no one when you can't find someone who won't say. God, it's never been this bad. Yeah, I mean, whatever happens, you've never had it so good. Exactly. Remember that one? Yes. Yes. I mean, I was, you know, I came of age during the 80s, which in hindsight, you know, you, people forget that it was like in America, Reaganomics, the onset of AIDS, you know, terrible economy. But we think of it as, oh, my gosh, everything was so plush. Everything was so fabulous. And it's like, well, depends, you know, dying, dying men and a president who doesn't care kind of a problem yeah <laughs> so yeah. um oddly let's be positive let's be positive <laughs> but oddly this does sort of dovetail into what rich is here to talk about he's got a brand new program called berlin um actually it's, it's berlin press right berlin station berlin station excuse me oh, you will. my notes are, are my glasses are not as clear as they need <laughs> to be it's a 10-part series where uh richard plays uh uh, Daniel Miller, who has just uh, arrived to the CIA station in Berlin, and um, they're trying to hunt down this uh, whistleblower who's masquerading as Thomas Shaw. It's very fun. Yeah, it's it's really interesting. And I was just like looking on looking on the newsfeed this morning about Julian Assange. Um, where is he? What's happened to him? I, I read on? one theory that Pamela Anderson has killed him with a vegan sandwich. I mean, <laughs> that's where we're at. Um, it's that out of control. It's out of control. Well, I mean, it makes it makes our fictitious TV show look very, very tame compared to what, what is really potentially happening. But yeah, um, Daniel sent in to, to basically track down this whist- whistleblower, Thomas Shaw, who is potentially lifting the lid on all of the CIA secrets, blowing agents, blowing assets. Um, and the whole system, the whole institution is potentially going to fracture, which is which is pretty dangerous when you think it's the front line of our intelligence services out there in the, you know, in the fight against terrorism and, and everything and, and that that it is potentially going to collapse, um, which I think is Thomas Shaw's intention. Thomas Shaw is our Edward Snowden figure. So right. Daniel has quite a mission on his hands and he's he's kind of a solo, a solo mission. It's a really what I've seen of the show so far. I've seen I've seen two episodes, uh, and what I've seen so far is wildly thrilling and compelling. And yet, the best part of it all is that it's smart. It, yeah, it, it it requires that you think while you watch. You this is not the kind of show y'all where you can have your mobile device nearby. You actually need to watch the screen and pay attention <laughs> to it. And it's I mean old school, but 
it's, but it's compelling enough to make you not want your mobile device, which is very unusual for entertainment these days. Yeah, it's interesting. People get very nervous when you tell them it's a slow burn. Um, and they it, do. And that you have to kind of pay attention. Like you, There are names and things um, mentioned in episode one that we don't really revisit until much later in the series. Um, and yeah, I, I feel like the, the kind of action-based stuff it's great for a shortcut trailer where you think, oh, I might w- like to watch that show, but, but we, are, we are a slow burn. We, we unfold a very complicated Pandora's box quite slowly and deliberately, and, and uh, you will get to know each and every single one of these characters intimately. Well, what's, what, what I can already tell from the show is that it's classic in its structure in that everything is there for a reason. Every name is spoken for a reason. Every person appears on camera for a reason. It's just not clear always the first time you hear the name, the first time you see the person. You have to sort of follow through. It's, 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 a, it's, it's traditional in, in both uh, novel structure but in, in, in storytelling structure in general. I've, you know, back in the day, before we were uh, you know, a multitasking nation where we couldn't watch a, a film or a television show without something in our hands, and I'm guilty of this as well, um, you had to pay attention because everything meant something. You know, we live in an age now, I believe, where shows and movies are meant to be fast forwarded through, mm-hmm. you know, hit the high points. And in fact, you even see shows now where the action moves at an accelerated pace, where it's like, and then it lands in normal pace. This is old school down. I love it. Well, here's the thing as well. I think television is made in a slightly different way now. It's, it's made because when you, when you watch a show, you, I mean, you call it my television show. I'm watching my show. You know, yes. Years ago, you would be reliant on the broadcaster that would air the show and then you'd never see it again until you bought the box set. Now, you can watch this show five or six times before you see the next episode if, if you want. If you feel like you've missed something or if there's little clues, and there are clues peppered throughout the entire, yeah. uh, each episode, you can go back in there and have, a, have, a, have another look. I mean, there's one, there's one clue in episode one which is very, very subtle, and it's a little scar on Daniel's back, which is Ooh. the camera doesn't show it to you. It's just a focus pull. It's a tiny little focus pull, and it's so subtle that people haven't spotted it yet. Well, it's, it's, a clue. it's funny because <laughs> I didn't think about it until you said it. I remember watching it and thinking... I'm going to, I'm supposed to see this. And then I, and then or I, for, you? <laughs> and then I, but then I forgot about it. Right. But I, cause it was, it's a fleeting moment. Yeah. I love that because it's almost like going on a treasure hunt. Exactly. And that's one of the things that, um, you know, I've said this before, but there were, there were sleepless nights where I would have, uh, you know, episode five in my hands and I just couldn't get my head into it and I couldn't understand it. And I, I'd be emailing the showrunner and saying, what's happening? Where, wh-? And it's exactly, how these operatives are working, you know, they are having to, they're, they're in a kind of soup and they don't really know everyone else's agenda. You know, Daniel does not know what's happening with this, with um, uh, Alexander Yosefa. He doesn't know everyone else's business. He only knows his own path. So um, I like the idea that, that all of these people are seemingly working for a single institution in a kind of n- network of, of, uh, theories and ideas but they don't always they can only see it from their perspective and and as an audience member we follow daniel through this um through this chaos so it's it's 10 episodes right it is is it closed or is it something that's meant to carry on potentially past this do do, uh, can we watch this and see that um daniel could just move on to another case um Without yeah. giving away the ending, because I hate plot spoilers. So here's the thing. We, <clears throat> they did shoot two endings. So Daniel's survival is, is up in the air. But he does lead the audience down a path. That would drive me nuts, <laughs> not knowing. Nuts. As, an a- as an actor, are, are, you, are you just crazy now, not knowing? They, they did come to me and tell me they were going to do it. And I immediately went, great. Yes, do it. Let's, let's really, let's go there. Oh, I like, you're, oh you're one of those. I am. <laughs> I, am. <laughs> I, I like, I like a good, um, moment where you, you, where you don't know, where you, where I don't know. Yeah. And that also, would drive me crazy. The, the kind of path that we tread through 10 episodes is it's a very specific, uh, hunt for one man. And then the door that they, they, exit from at the end of the series or the door that they enter into the second series if there is one 
um, throws a much more complicated and frustrating light on everything. See, I, wanna, I already want to strangle you right now, Richard. <laughs> Richard Armitage I'm joining us here on, on EW Radio. We're talking about uh, the new show, Berlin Station. Uh, I haven't I have neglected to mention that it's on Epix, which is becoming quite the nice little place to get some quality programming. Yeah. It's really, uh, you know, the, we've talked with a number of people from a number of projects in the last couple of weeks and, and um, it's, it's, a, it's become a, a really interesting new vessel. Yeah, I was really proud that. last night to, to see the way that Epics showcased their first original scripted drama, um, the, the pre-lap for it, the, the interview afterwards, just the quality of the image yeah. on the screen, the, 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 the director of photography, Hagen Bogdansi, has created something which is just cinematic. So it sits, you know, Epics is premium cable, so it has, I mean, they, they showed Spectre, the James Bond movie, right. before it. And I, I was worried, I thought, oh, is our show going to stand up against something of that in, in enormous budget? But actually, it, it, it really sat next to it in a, in, a, in a similar way. So It makes for a very nice package. And, and when you're premium cable, you have to give the people who are paying the extra to get it something lush something sumptuous and uh, and um this show definitely ticks that box without question i'm curious to know though um how you find navigating this new world order of television and filmmaking um versus what you fantasized your life would be like the new world order being that a project like berlin station 10, 20 years ago would be part of the norm, right? Complex, traditional storytelling, very much part of what we were getting during the 70s, during the 80s. It started to wane off in the 90s. But now it's, it's very fast food. It really, I do feel like a lot of entertainment is designed for people who are not paying attention at all times. Yeah, I mean, and you, you're asking me that question as a consumer or as an actor? As an actor. Okay, so from from what I'm seeking to for my work. Yeah, from what because is are are the challenges the same? Are is the satisfaction the same? You know, it's probably the same answer for consumer and actor. I I go in hunt of something which is going to challenge me and is going to be satisfying to consume. Uh, from the inside out, but also as a consumer, I feel like now we're in a place where pitching something and advertising something to me is going to have less effect rather than me thinking, what do I want to watch and going in search of it? It must be out there somewhere. Right. Um, and I, but I do feel like there's subliminal imagery that comes at you in terms of the, the marketing machine. Like Epix has a great way of rolling out their, their work and you're, we're very aware of it. And it's a, it's a sort of fast single image, which, is you know that's marketing that's their business but in terms of what i was seeking to you know the opportunity to play um a character over 10 episodes in this depth is compelling i wanted something political current relevant you know 23 episodes is a little bit more difficult um so and i think we're seeing a lot more kind of short shorter well, series 23 episodes you have a minimum of seven episodes that are not going to be that good right it's just the law of averages um but there's lots of it and it's kind of satisfying yeah you know? I, I i like the way this show's rolling out versus other current entertainment in that i don't want to binge a whole series very interesting i don't mark greenberg feels the same he doesn't want to let I you binge <laughs> don't want to binge because i feel like you miss something because all you want to be able to do is say on Monday morning when you revisit your friends at work is I binged blah, blah, blah. Now, how much of that did you retain? Yeah. Because I like the idea before uh, technology allowed me to revisit a show, I would create my own version, my own technology that would allow me to, whether it meant putting it on a, on a videotape or back in the 70s when I was a kid obsessed with shows, I would just record the audio and just listen to right. it. You know, because, you know, great, great work should sound as compelling as it looks. Um, binging stuff that you already, you've already seen is fun as it ramps up to the new episode. But I, I don't want to see all 10 hours of the show at once. Yeah, you don't. Re if you, I think when you binge on something, you don't really taste very much. No, it's like going to a food court and filling a tray with five meals. What, yeah. All they really taste like is fat. <laughs> Yeah. Right? It just tastes like a glob of fat. 
salty fat. I'd much rather savor it. And that's why I don't like plot spoilers yeah. because I want to discover it. You know, I'm like one of those guys. I want to kind of be uh, jumping all the time. You know what I mean? Yeah. So why did you go into this business in the first place? When you were a kid, where are you from originally? We're, we're in I'm from the Midlands. I'm from Leicestershire. You're from Leicestershire. Do you oh, know that name? Yes, I sure do. Of because of I the do. football team. Yeah. And because I'm married to a Brit and you have to learn all these different <laughs> okay. provinces and stuff so that you understand. Because after a while you learn the different act, you know, you talk to someone, you'll be like, oh, you, where are you a from? A little regional dialect. Yeah, a little yeah, regional dialect. Specific. Um, where, how do you grow up in, in Leicestershire thinking, oh yeah, I'm going to do this. Um, not really what happens. That's in that, the eternal in that. question. I have no idea. None of my family members were ever in show business. Um, well, they wouldn't be in that, in that area. Not really. No. Uh, so, <clears throat> so were you watching, uh, Corey or some movie and thinking, I want to do that. It like, was, no, it was never screened for me. It was always theater. It was always theater. I, yeah. So but, when did you go to your first play? Um, I, I think it kind of, my interest in literature came from studying English literature at advanced level. And I, my first play that had any real impact on me was the Royal Shakespeare Company. I went to see a production of Midsummer Night's Dream when I was studying it for A-level. So I must have been 14 or 15. Um, and that's 14 when 14 or 15, so studying Midsummer Night's Dream. Yeah. Wow. Is that too young or too old? <laughs> that's incredible. Is it? Um, that's in, that's amazing yeah but it, i remember leaning so forward and thinking boy. they look like they're having fun and wow they get paid for doing that um i could get paid for doing that so was it was it was it language and and words that were attractive to you was it the play i'm getting the idea that it might be words it was the fact that when i'd read it as a study i it was dead to me it just didn't it was just words on a page that i that i had to pour over but then sitting in front of it when it was alive in front of me not only understanding it, but engaging with them and kind of being on the journey with them. Like it was the root of storytelling. It's exactly what a storyteller does when the storyteller captivates you for a second and you forget where you are and you get absorbed into that story. And I feel like I've always held on to that idea that I'm, I'm a storyteller. It's not about me. Mm. It's about the story. So, um, from your point of view, who were, cause when, it's funny when I hear the, I think we all have this this experience. Those of us who like storytellers or who fancy ourselves some level of storyteller, um, I hear the word storytelling. I think of great American storytellers. I think of Mark Twain. I think of my favorite characters in American plays. Like you look like Tom from the Glass Menagerie, although Tom from the Glass Menagerie is a Southern man. So, <laughs> do you know what I mean? But yeah. But what you're describing is, I would love to hear you work on your accent and hear you do that character okay have you do you know the piece uh i do yeah i mean he's a he's kind of an interesting bittery kind of guy but he's also the guy who 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 who, un, who unfolds the story right who are your storytellers who are the storytellers beyond beyond um the classics if there are any whom you're attracted to um as authors um because i guess because i studied literature yeah um i the Victorian novelists were were quite prevalent on my radar. So, so the Brontes and Ooh. Austin. Uh, I mean, I was sort of forced to to read them. Rather, than, I mean, um, Dickens. I think he's probably the greatest British storyteller that we've had. I mean, and, and yeah, without uh, doubt. Um, I've recently did an, an audio book for for Audible. I, I read David Copperfield. I think it was one of my favorite novels, and I do think it's like the best one of the best no novels ever written really so um, but then i went to the russians as well so i mean i'm all over the shop in terms i just you know but uh, you like but you like the you like the classics uh i do but then i'm not opposed to picking up a, a kind of bestseller that's very interesting and then going and making a movie of it <laughs> well that but but very interesting though because there's there's something before even seeing you today and we've and we have met before but what I get from watching your work is, is a degree of reverence for what you're playing. Um, I don't feel like you go in and say, well, you know, this character in this classic piece would never say that. Yeah. 
No, I do. I mean, more and more, the older I get, um, the more I feel like I'm just a vessel for the, for the voice of the author and for the construction that he's made of the character. I mean, you can't help but bring yourself to the, to the role and, and, you know, hiding your opinions is not a good thing. I, you know, playing Daniel Miller, I, I had definitely had an opinion of what it means to be a patriot and what it means to be the person that you, that, that wants to stop the flow of blood from a whistleblower. I, I have a personal opinion about that, but I have to also honor the writer's opinion of it. And so how do you balance that? Because I frequently find myself talking with actors who um, have to deal with the judgment that a normal person would have for a character, for, for a person they're playing versus playing a person whom they would judge. Yeah, I mean, and that's the that's the the trap that you could potentially fall into is that I feel like you don't necessarily always have to like or agree with the character that you're playing. And actually, I mean, it always comes back to the idea that we all start from the same place. And so I've played quite a few kind of despicable characters in my time, mainly, mainly fictional. Um, you know, I, I played a serial killer on Hannibal, which I struggled with. I struggled to, to sort of have any empathy with, with him, but, that was my job is to go in there and try and be empathic with, with a character that does appalling things. Um, that's one of the challenges. Were you, when you, what kind of kid were you? Were you like one of those kids with a great imagination or were you, you don't sound like you were, you sounds like you read, but you read initially out of obligation, not out of hunger. Yeah. I, I guess I, I was bookish. I suppose I played a, a couple of musical instruments which means that you do spend a lot of time saying to your parents, look, I'm going to go upstairs and practice and you shut the door and then you're alone with your musical instrument or you're alone with your cassette player. And you so I listened to loads of music and I would go and sort of shut the door and finish the book that my, that my parents had bought for me. So, uh, and I loved that. I, I, it was, I would definitely wasn't kind of pushed towards that. It was something that, that kind of, I just wanted it. So did you have a good fantasy life or did you, were you, were you just really studying something at all times? It was, I think it was the fantasy life and, and I, but, it, but going back to what you said about storytelling, I feel like I was always in search of a good story. I loved getting lost in a story and, mm. and I think music has a story. So, oh, yeah. you know, I, I remember I studied music as well. Music and English were a good combination of the two. So I remember being forced to listen to, uh, Beethoven. Beethoven's Eroica Symphony, I think it's number four or number six, one of the two. Um, and, th and I didn't, never really liked it, but, but when, once you start pulling it apart and getting lost in the story of it, it's, uh, it's now, I know every inch of that, that symphony now. So um, it enabled me to go and listen to other pieces of music and find the story in it and, and have a huge eclectic music taste. So, you know, I'll listen to, Miley Cyrus and be like, yeah, I know what story she's, she's telling, mm. telling me there. And, um, so yeah. The reason why I ask is because to me, all of this sort of explains, actually explains, to, I think it explains a lot of how you play the men you play and it, and it kind of gives a little bit more perspective as a viewer into all of your roles, but particularly Daniel. So I'm curious to know, with the approach that you've had to study and to exploration and storytelling and fantasy, all those things, which of those elements, what are the things that, that have become second nature to you brings you into Daniel? What's your entry point into him? I think just the curiosity about every man. And I think even when you're, you know, the first stages of, of finding out who Daniel was going to be was it, it really was a blank canvas, mm. um, which is in a way the most difficult thing to throw at an actor to say, look, we don't really know what we want from this character. You need to go away and create him. It's, it's a really tough one because you, you have to kind of create somebody real, not just somebody that is going to be a kind of televisual character with shocks and bells and whistles and all that kind of stuff. You have to you have to risk him being mundane because most people essentially are mundane, regular, every, every man, every, right. every men. Um, and I, I toyed with the idea of making him, um, have some kind of exceptionalism about him. But then I really thought, no, just make him regular, make him a regular guy. He's not, not particularly brilliant at anything. 
but he's thrown into an extraordinary circumstance. And it was a bit of a risk. I, I risked making him too gray. Um, but it's, he has to rise to the challenge and he, he discovers his exceptionalism through doing his job. So it's, 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 it's the challenge of the job that makes him ping, that makes him, because. Much like me though. Is it really? Yeah. I feel like I'm, I'm so much more mundane than, than any role I've ever taken on. And it's what keeps me stepping forward into the next role because it's, it challenges you. And the, the amount of skills I've picked up through just being an actor, the, the amount of places I've gone to and the thing, you know, I can, I can suture a, a wound because I played a doctor. <laughs> I've, Why not? You know, I've, sim- I've replicated a, a thoracotomy where you cut someone's ch- chest open and restart their heart. I mean, it was a, it was a weird working model, but I, I've kind of done it. It's, you know, I ride a horse, I've swing a sword around, I've done a whole, whole bunch of things that, that I would never have done, but I get to sort of, you know, flesh it out. That's a very interesting way of building your identity because most people will say, I am not going to carry the identity of my job. In fact, that's usually the challenge. Right. That's certainly been one of my challenges to not get all of my identity from my work. Um, do you ever find yourself exhausted then by absorbing all that is interesting about these guys you play? Yeah, it can be interesting when you have a down period where you're not prepping for something and you're not finishing something off. Yeah. Particularly when it comes to, you know, stepping out of your house in the morning, you think, well, I don't really know what costume am I going to wear today? I don't know. What does Richard wear? How does he dress? Or, you know, choosing the next thing I'm going to read, which isn't research for something. Um, I mean, I've got a stack of books that I'm desperate to read, but I've, I've already got stuff coming in for the next project. But do you, so then do you grieve for them when they leave? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you do. I mean, you. Hopefully, by the time you get to the end, you've you've excavated everything you wanted from the character, but but, and so you're you're looking forward to putting them down for a while. Certainly, with something like The Hobbit, I was looking forward to to saying goodbye to that character. Yeah. At the end of it, because I did feel like we'd we'd kind of excavated him. But other characters like uh, John Proctor, I played on stage in The Crucible. I feel like I'm not done with that character yet. I may, I may go back and do him again. So he haunts you. Yeah, a little bit. So do you, after you do 10 weeks of, which obviously takes more than 10 weeks, but 10 weeks of Daniel, uh, in Berlin station, do you, do you feel, uh, a hunger to explore someone very similar to him? or someone as far away from him as possible. You're thinking, I really just feel like laughing today. Yeah, which is exactly why I went and did the play that I'm doing. Well, so let's tell us about that. It's exactly that. I mean, you, you, you finish, you finish your, your spy thriller where you're walking around with a poker face most of the time and really concealing what it is you're thinking and feeling. So I can't come out of that and think, what do I need next? What do I want next? You know, what have I not done before? What's the next challenge? And, um, I didn't necessarily choose the play that I'm doing. Um, love, love, love by Mike Bartlett at the roundabout. There you go. Amazing. <laughs> um, it's, it kind of came to me. Um, and I rarely get to play comedy. I didn't even realize it was a comedy when I was reading it until we put it up in front of an audience. Um, oh, that's going to be terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> if you start hearing Everyone people laugh and you're, a... play, and you're playing it straight, <laughs> that's going to, but I think that's the key to it. I mean, I kept, People kept saying to me, oh, it's brilliantly funny, isn't it? I was like, I don't really find this that funny, actually. But Well, you were really in him. Uh, yeah. The, we, we do get to disappear. It's so strange. Time um, in theater, you know, we start act one, and then I find myself coming off at the end of act three, and I'm thinking, what happened to my three? Where did those three hours go? You really, it's like wow. someone removes a little piece of time from you. Wow. It's fun. That sounds awesome. Yeah. That does that sounds unbelievably good. Um, Richard Amitage joining us here on EW Radio. So I think it's very, very bold of you to say all of this because I don't think I've ever interviewed an actor who, I think I've interviewed actors who function very much the way you do, but I don't think that they're willing to say that. Okay. No, I do because I think that there's a certain kind of swag, you know, it's not swag, that's the wrong word, but there's a certain kind of, willingness of surrender that you're that you're describing that i think most people in general 
would never because it implies a vulnerability mm-hmm. and a and a willing and a need and willingness to care as much as possible about what you're doing. Most people don't want to do that because it makes them feel weak. Even though it is, I think it's quite the opposite. I think it's a very strong person who, who submits to a well-written character. Yeah. Well, they're always they're always better than I am, and and worse than I am, more interesting than I am. Um, yeah. Well, I don't know about that because <laughs> we've been talking for nearly a half hour, and uh, it's flown by, and it's all on the strength of you talking about your life and your work. So you're quite an interesting fellow, Mister Armitage. Um, but I I can't wait to to see this new play and I can't wait to see what you, what you sink your teeth into next because that's be to me. That's the work of a character actor, a proper character actor. Yeah. I'm in it for life. I'm not in it for a, for a quick fix. Well, congratulations. It's nice to see you. You too. Look for Richard Armitage in the, uh, the epics show Berlin station. And it's really good. It's really, really good. And love, love, love at the roundabout. Yeah. How long are you there for? We're there till I think the 18th of December. So you have a little bit of time, but tickets tend to go quickly because uh, Roundabout's a, a nice size but intimate uh, venue. So um, don't sleep on that one. And uh, I look forward to our next conversation. Me too. Stick around. There's more.